have a question for you. How far are you willing to go for your career, for your kids, your grandkids, um, maybe to find a spouse? Maybe you'll go on a mission trip to find a spouse. That's what I heard there is like I heard that if you are looking to find a spouse, you go on a mission trip. I don't think that's the point of their testimony, but you know, if you're single, looking for a spouse, go on a mission trip. Better other things can happen. But uh, we're willing to go really, really far for our careers, right? We'll give up vacation time. We'll put off purchases. We'll do things to make sure that we can get pretty far within our careers. But how far are we willing to go with Jesus? How far are we willing to go for our neighbors, our friends, to bring them the message of good news? How far are we willing to go to allow the message of Christ to embed itself in our heart to where if we have to make shifts that may cost us, we'll actually do it? How far are you willing to go? That is this series, this initiative called Forward. Over the last couple months, we've been praying and we've been discerning together as a body, as the Holy Spirit has been doing work within this church, individually through the lives of people, but also corporately through our witness of people who come here week in and week out and raise up the name of Jesus. We've started in small groups that have built out to larger groups that have went to community to gatherings asking the question of what does it look like to move forward in faith and to move forward together, not leaving anybody behind, but discerning this together. And as we've discerned and we've prayed during times of great discernment, God often illuminates or highlights a portion of scripture that is edifying to us. And one of the portions of scripture that God has raised up is our theme verse that comes from Philippians. And I want to read that with us together today. And it says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focused on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. So my question, again, maybe a little different, is this. Will you follow where God leads? Even if it's difficult, and maybe even if in the moment you disagree with it. You know, in our culture today, resiliency is not a strong value as much anymore. I feel like resiliency has kind of gone to the wayside. When things get difficult, it's really easy to step aside to something that might be easier. You know, in your job, if things aren't going your way or if you're struggling, there's a lot of people looking for good candidates in other jobs. It's easy to go apply and find another job. You have a sports team. I mean, we live in Chicago, right? There's not much to be excited about here for sports. Maybe in a year or two. But you can, you know, subscribe to another sports team. Um, Your child or your grandkids aren't getting playing time in a sport. It's easy to put them in something else where they will get playing time. Your church upsets you. There's a lot of churches here in Naperville, right? If you don't like something, there's community down the way. There's Our Saviors down over here. There's there's churches on every corner. It's really easy to just step away when we don't like something. And don't get me wrong. There are times when you need to step away, when there's abuse, when there's gaslighting, where it is no longer safe for you or your family. Yes, we step away to protect the things that are very important to us. But sometimes we step away prematurely. This was me as a teen growing up. In any relationship, any dating relationship, friendship, whenever I was challenged or pushed to think of something a different way, I'd be like, no, I'm good. I'm going to go hang out over here. I'm going to go spend time over here. You're calling out things that are probably important, and I should probably look at that, but it's a lot easier to just be with friends that will just affirm everything about me that makes me feel better. As a pastor, that's a real danger as well. There can be people that kind of say, hey, you know that message? It was bad. And I can be like, 
well, they said it was good. I'm going to go spend time with them because they're nice. But that doesn't do any good if we're only with people that are only agreeable to us. It's in the tension that growth occurs. It's through the difficulty and struggle and the navigating real relationships that cause us to grow. And it's in those moments of tension that resilience builds, but it's also in those moments of where we are wrestling together where, guess what? God does God's best work as we grow. And so these next couple of weeks, we're going to ask you to continue to lean in, be spending time in prayer, reflecting on the messages, be a part of the small group material that are in your booklet. Be asking God to build up resilience in you as we co-labor together. Because this isn't a solitary endeavor. This is a group effort that we grow and we learn and we dream together. And in doing so, I believe that we might move forward in faith because God is asking us to move forward in faith. This whole thing is a discipleship journey. We're going to be diving into scripture. We're going to be praying. We're going to be looking at the word of God and see how God wants to breathe new life into us. And I'm excited to walk with it because as a pastor newer in this community, a year ago, I was dreaming about becoming a pastor here because in three, four days, a year from Thursday would have been the time the congregation voted for me to be a called pastor here at this church. And so for me, it's humbling to get to learn and grow and walk together. And these messages are birthed out of holy imagination of talking with you, not about you, not without you, but with you as we dream together. But first, I hate crowds. Anybody else like hate crowds? Like the security line at the airport, my stress level goes through the roof when I'm at like a concert or yesterday we were at Callahan Farms and there was like a lot of kids running everywhere and I'm like, I, I just can't do this. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of crowds. I would prefer like being in the mountains on like a trail with nobody around but the good Lord and the good creation. There's a lot of people who say, you have two young daughters. You should take them to Disney. They would have a blast. And then I asked them, describe Disney to me. And they're like, well, you know, you spend a lot of money and you go and you go down there and it's like really hot. And so everybody's sunburnt and cranky and it's like really, really greasy food. All the kids are running around screaming because they're excited, but they didn't sleep because they flew down and like they are eating food that they're not used to. They're sleeping beds they're not used to. And so they're running. Everybody's kind of tired, but like it's the happiest place on earth. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Crowds. Sweaty human beings. That is the context of our gospel today in the book of Mark. Everywhere Jesus goes, there are crowds. There are people. Even when he tries to get away, guess what? There's people everywhere. And there's good reason why. Jesus is doing something that no one has seen before. He is saying good news and showing a world that has been waited for, but they haven't seen, but it's finally coming to fruition. Hope is happening. Mark 1 through 15 says this, The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. See, the world is coming a new and different way. See it how you've seen it, but see it what is happening and believe the good news. Jesus preached the good news and people were listening. He was preaching in a way that no one has seen before. He has authority and they're leaning in going, who is this man? He casts out spirits. He heals the sick. The kingdom is coming. The longing for a better world is on the horizon and the word continued to spread. Jesus was healing. He was preaching. And then he comes to Simon Peter's house, and he ends up healing Peter's mom. And the, the word says this, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. Unannounced, by the way. How many of you had people like unannounced drop in at your house? Now wait, verse 33. Now imagine if this happened. The whole town gathered at the door. This is my nightmare. 
This is like my living nightmare. I'm the type that wants to have like everything in order in my house. But like if my entire neighborhood like showed up at my door, but not just that, they brought like all their ailments. Because let's be honest, we're kind of gross. And that's okay. I'm married to a nurse. I know we're gross. The story she tells at dinner time, mm mm. This is my nightmare. But Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Crowds and more crowds. People are wanting to get to Jesus. People need to get to Jesus. And in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus gets away, but people still need to get to him. His disciples come and get to him and says, hey, we got to go. And Jesus says, well, let's keep preaching. The word continues to spread. Jesus heals a leper, someone who's been pushed on the outside of society, that's on the brink of life and death because there's no community, there's no hope because of what this person has. But Jesus doesn't just heal this leper, he touches him. Jesus, you're going to get the funk. Don't touch him. Jesus touches the leper. The one on the outside of society, the ostracized that has no community, no family, no hope. Jesus steps in and touches him. Jesus bypasses the temple system. Jesus, there's a way you're supposed to do this. And it gets him in trouble. And then in our story today, Jesus heals sin. And there's this charge of blasphemy because only God can heal sin. There's a very specific way you're supposed to present yourself in the temple. Who is this dude to say that he can forgive sin? Later on, he calls a tax collector to be one of his disciples, and he sits and eats with a bunch of sinners. Who is this Jesus? And then on the Sabbath, where you rest, Jesus heals. There's some things about this Jesus that are important. This Jesus we follow in the Gospel of Mark, he's not so concerned with religious protocols. This Jesus, he wants to forgive sins because guess what? He can. Also, Jesus was uncomfortably comfortable with people who were on the outside, who were sinners. And we are called to follow this Jesus. But sometimes Jesus asks us to follow him to places that are uncomfortable. But the question is, even if it's uncomfortable, will you still say yes? And in our text today in Mark 2, as we read earlier, guess what Jesus is doing in that home? He's preaching. He's teaching. He's talking about the good news. And you guessed it. Guess what? There's another crowd. They are crowding in the home, outside the door, in the courtyard. People are wanting to get to Jesus, and Jesus is doing what Jesus does. He preaches, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come. Repent, what kingdom? Lepers are being made whole. They are brought back into community, no longer on the brink of life or death, but now home. A mother-in-law who is about to die is healed. A demon possessed who has been pushed to the outside has been set free. Life is breaking in. Sins are being forgiven. Hope is restored. This is the kingdom Come on earth as it is in heaven. And people are wanting to get to Jesus to experience. There's people that want to get to Jesus because they want to experience it. But there's also people who can't get there by themselves. When you read that phrase, people want to get to Jesus, but some people can't get there by themselves, what kind of people come to mind? Is it a grandkid that maybe you were here at their baptism, but the family isn't a part of church right now? Is it a spouse? Has something happened over the years where it has drawn you and your faith apart? And so you're here worshiping on Sundays by yourself or secretly maybe watching online? Is it a coworker? They've seen what has happened in church world online and they've seen and they're like, you know, if I want a circus, I can get it everywhere else. I don't have to give up my Sundays to see a circus. Is it a friend? 
Maybe you, you sit here and you go, people want to get to Jesus, but some people can't get there by themselves, and you have a friend in mind. What if part of our moving forward in faith is about helping bring people back to Jesus? What if this moment in our history is a reorienting of our heart and our mission, specifically for the world, for our neighbors, and for this specific locale? What if moving forward is about all about bringing people to the feet of Jesus? Because for me, I think that's it. We have four people in this story that are trying to bring someone to Jesus. We don't know who they are or what they do or even if they're friends. We just know that they're trying to get this man to Jesus who couldn't get there by himself. Not only do they bring him to Jesus, but they create a brand new way of coming to Jesus because the old way is blocked. They can't get through. People are crowding the door, the courtyard, and they can't get to Jesus. Mark 2, 4 through 5 says this, Since they could not get to him because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, when he saw their faith, he said to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. When I read this passage, a question comes to mind. Um, Do only my needs matter? And I ask this question as a pastor, as a Christian, as a dad, as a spouse, and as a parent. Do only my needs matter? When I hear us discerning of where we're wanting to go forward, is my preference what's most important? Is it my way or the highway? If the church decides to focus on a certain group, do I ask, what about me? And then this is a hard question. And as a pastor, I ask this all the time. Am I getting in the way of those that are deeply in need? The way I lead, the way I talk, the way I use my social media. Am I a stumbling block for people trying to get to Jesus? Are people stumbling over me trying to get to Christ? That's a haunting question. And it's one that I think about every single week as a pastor, as a friend, as a spouse, as a parent the dad. Jesus sees their faith and says to the man, your sins are forgiven. Moving forward in faith matters in seeing the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Our lives have incredible power to reach people. Every action or inaction, our kindness, when we choose to live out our faith, it matters. Your prayer matters. Your giving matters. Your dreaming matters. Every act of kindness, goodness, repentance, moments of forgiveness, experiences of new creation, all of those things will echo into the world to come. We don't build the kingdom, but we do build for the kingdom. And every action that we do actually matters. Not for what's to come when we close our eyes to this life, but in the here and now. But unfortunately, the reverse is also true. How many of you use Facebook? There's this lovely feature on there called Memories, where you can look back and see things. Um, This memory popped up two days ago, this quote from Thomas Merton, and I thought it fit really well in this message. Thomas Merton says this, Do not be quick to condemn the man who no longer believes in God. Because maybe it was your own coldness or avarice your mediocrity and materialism, your sensuality and your selfishness that may have killed their faith. Ouch, Thomas. Many people have walked away from church faith because of our collective witness, but the reverse is also true. People will come back to Christ, come back to the church, will see Jesus if Jesus-looking people catch the vision of Christ. And we choose to be people who bring others to Jesus. We see the needs around us. We choose to exist for the benefit of others. We want to follow God where God is leading. And instead, we choose to create space for people. We knock down walls. We open up ceilings. And we ask the question, God, where are you at work? And when God answers, we join that place. Your faith matters, and God works through the gifts we bring as an offering. But as you start to create space, 
as you look like Jesus, as you act like Jesus, and you catch that vision, Jesus-looking people will get in the way. The teachers of the law are hearing this and watching this, and I don't know why they're there, but they're noticing that Jesus is gathering and following. They want to be there. And in their minds, they say, who is this dude that he can do this? Could you imagine if your innermost thoughts were like on a jumbotron? No! No! That would be terrible. I mean, that would be fun, like Thanksgiving around a dinner table with people with very different opinions and beliefs. That would be really fun. That should be a TV show. Someone should do that. It would be really, really fun. But they're watching this and they go, no, this guy is blasphemy. This isn't right. Only God can do this. And Jesus heard them, knew their thoughts, and he calls them out. He says, which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to get up, take your mat, and walk? Jesus, this is a weird question. These leaders have heard about Jesus, have seen what he has done. He's healed, touched, and he's preached the good news. That's why they're there. They're curious, and the crowds continue to grow. Yes, they think it's blasphemy, but right there in that moment, they're not going to say anything. They can only watch and wait and see what happens. I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed a few people. This amazed everyone. And a few people praised God. No, everyone praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Your sins are forgiven. Your body is healed. Oh, and because of this miracle, because a moment of new creation has happened, did you catch that in the verse? Everyone was amazed and they praised God. What would it take for you to be amazed by God again? What does that look like? What would it look like for you to go, I can't believe that happened. God, you've heard my prayers. You've seen my thoughts. You've known what's going on and you have shown up. Would it take seeing family members come back to the faith because of this church? seeing marriages come together, seeing and hearing children live out the good news, being a church in a place where those with disabilities are given a seat at the forefront and aren't just brought out and paraded for giving moments, but are actually valued as members of the church. I believe that God wants to challenge us, but I also believe that God wants to amaze us. I think God is ready to do a new work in our hearts. And if we say yes our response will only be, wow, God, look what you've done. There's one more interesting detail in this story. I don't know if you caught it. This man has a mat. He's lowered down in a mat. Jesus says, pick up your mat. Says it again, pick up your mat. And then the text says he picked up his mat and he went. When the Bible repeats a certain detail, that's important. We should lean in. But why would Jesus report, re, I mean, why? Is it just for like practical purposes? It's crowded. Pick up your mat because more people need to get in. So for practical purposes, pick it up and get out of the way. Is it to like humbly remind him, like treat others better because you used to be here? I, I don't think that's the case. And so I'm going to give you my take. And this is a past, this is what pastors do. We look at little details and we're like, All right, I'm going to give you what I think. Um, I think Jesus asked him to take up his mat so that he can bring others to Jesus, that his faith will be lived out, and that moving forward in faith means following God where he leads. That mat carried him. That mat had been there in so many places, and there have been mats in your life. Specifically, if you call Good Shepherd home, This space has been a mat that has brought so many people to Jesus. At the Abbey, when this was built, when we added the activity center, the cafe and worship center, every moment we haven't said, this mat's good, let's just leave it as is. We keep leaning into what God is doing and saying, okay, God, what do you have next? Because your spirit is blowing through and we want to catch it. So I want to end with these two questions. Who's the one that brought you to Jesus? Who's that person you have to thank? 
we all didn't get here alone. Someone blazed the trail before us. And as we look forward, I think it's important to look back first. Because we stand on the shoulders of people that have sacrificed, who have loved, who have prayed, who have done so much work, and we get to reap the benefits. There's so many times that we sow seeds hoping that God does the work and we don't get to see it. But we get to see the seeds that have been sown. And my second question is similar. Who's God asking you to bring to Jesus? Who in your sphere of influence at work, at home, your grandkids, your family members, that you are perfectly positioned to say, hey, I know you've seen faith this way. Let's talk. It's better than that. Jesus is better than that. I don't want you tripping over church to get to Jesus. So let me kind of get in that gap before church even comes a part of the question. I think people are trying to get to Jesus and sometimes they are tripping over the church. But if we become that first person who goes out of our way to give ourselves away, I think beautiful things happen. Let's pray. God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. And there's so many people that are trying to get to you and some of them just can't. They can't bring themselves. And God, We want to go where you ask us to go. We don't lead the way. You've already gone there. Often you're just asking us to catch up. But Lord, you are asking us to be a part of this. It was my parents and my grandparents that brought me to the faith. When I thought I had no faith left, it was my parents that were there that never left. God, you've put people in my path that are trying to get to you and they've tripped over the church. Because God, we are both saint and sinner. We are both beautiful and at times really, really bad. But God, you love us deeply. Give us the strength to go to those places, to those places to bring the news. Here we pray. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.